Hi everyone and welcome to the RightsCast. I'm Nancy Leong and my guest for this episode is Khaled Beydoun, who's a professor at the Berry School of Law. Khaled is a specialist in a number of areas of law, including the intersection between race, religion, and the legal system. He's done some really groundbreaking work on Arab American identity and Muslim American identity. Prior to entering academia, Khaled uh, was a practitioner of both civil rights law, including with the ACLU and the criminal defense law. He is also a founding member of the Egyptian American Rule of Law Foundation. Now, when Khaled and I originally spoke, it was, I believe, the end of December, and we had a really wonderful conversation about his article, Between Muslim and White, the Legal Construction of Arab American Identity. Now, in light of recent events, which we're going to discuss in more detail later on in the episode, Khaled very kindly and generously agreed to come back and discuss the way that his research is even more relevant and even more timely now in light of um, some of these other things that have been going on. So what you'll see during the first half of this episode is our original conversation. During the second half of the episode, uh, we'll be focused more on recent events. You have this really interesting piece, The Legal Construction of Arab American Identity. And I hope that you could start just by telling us a little bit about why it's important well, first of all, it was really important for me to um, do one thing, and essentially it was to you know break this conflation um, of Arabs and Muslims. I think in American society still today, people still perceive Arab identity to be synonymous with Muslim identity, and many people believe that this you know conflation is a new phenomenon. It's something that is uh, you know was an outgrowth of uh, the 9/11 terrorist attacks, and my piece tried to de demonstrate that this stereotype and this conflation uh, was deeply embedded in American law. So I tried to, um, you know, provide, uh, you know, a missing legal history by going through a set of important cases to break the modern conflation. So one of the things that I really liked about your article, and you're the first person to do this, is that you look really closely at how the legal system has historically classified Arab American people. You look at uh, naturalization proceedings, which is where a lot of this classification took place. Yeah, so interestingly enough, I think that the legal history very much mirrors what's happening in modern uh, American society today, where, you know, religion, the, the religious affiliation of the individual oftentimes determined how initially the courts identified an individual racially. Um, and obviously, you know, things have shifted uh, legally today. Um, historically speaking, until 1952, there was legislation called the Naturalization Act uh, of 1790, which mandated that an individual be considered white to become a citizen. Obviously, that, that isn't the case today, um, but you have different kind of legal um, proxies in place which, um, you know, award informal white uh, status to individuals who might identify as Christian, and that Muslim identity essentially it has become a racial identity in and of itself, which I guess strips individuals from claims of whiteness. Yeah, one of the things that I thought was really interesting in your piece was how someone's religious beliefs affected the way that they were classified racially. Can you tell us just a little bit more specifically, I, I mean particularly because I don't think that this history is well known, can you tell us yeah. just a little bit more um, specifically about how this happened in the courts? Yeah, so there's a really important book by uh, from an individual named Edward Said, a really prominent Palestinian American intellectual, um, called Orientalism, which um, provides a very comprehensive uh, documentation of how uh, different halls of power in not only American but European society perceived the quote-unquote Muslim world. Um, and essentially, uh, these halls of power constructed the Muslim world from the specific vantage point of uh, European norms or European ideals and so forth. So, and this stems back from the days of the Crusades, obviously, when Islam and Muslims essentially functioned as the primary rivals uh, of Christianity. And Christianity, in some respects, was, you know, the proxy for the West, Europe and the States and so forth. And, and in America when it, when it became an independent nation. So you had the courts adopt this perspective and adopt this binary where any individual from the quote-unquote Muslim world was um, essentially pegged as being a rival, um, an antithesis of not only Western civilization, 
but whiteness, which became, you know, kind of the racial hallmark of Western civilization. And so how are Arab Americans uh, classified now? How does the United States government classify Arab Americans for purposes of the census? Are Arab Americans classified differently in different situations? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so with, with Arab Americans you have what, 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 I, what I call uh, racial misalignment. Um, in the sense that Arab Americans are formally classified as white. And this stems from um, uh, essentially two cases uh, that I discuss in the piece. So you're, you're awarded formal white identity, ho however on the ground obviously, and especially since 9-11, um, individuals who identify as uh, Arab American, you know, clearly are racially profiled, religiously profiled, um, and deemed, in, you know, are deemed a segment of society that are, uh, you know, linked to national security, suspicion, and threat. So there's a disconnect between the formal racialization and what's really happening on the ground. So on the one hand, um, you know, we have the U.S. government classifying um, Arab Americans, or you know, some would use the word Middle Eastern. We can talk about that in a minute yeah. about terminology. In terms of checking the box. This group of people is classified as white in terms of being out in society and exercising the privileges that are commonly associated with whiteness, like not being followed around when you're at the store, or not mm -hmm. being subjected to racial epithets, or just not being the target of suspicion as you go about your day-to-day -day life, that white privilege mm -hmm. isn't there. And so I think that um, that's a really important insight to point out um, that there's this disconnect there. Yeah, definitely, and I think it's also important to, 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 to highlight the, uh, the intersection, right? So individual Arab Americans who are also Muslim um, and express their, their Muslim identities in very conspicuous ways. So, obviously, you know, a man who might wear a beard and a, and a kufi, for instance, or a muhajjab, a woman who, you know, wears the headscarf, um, they're sitting at this intersection of being both Arab and Muslim, which intensifies the degree of suspicion and, you know, vis-a-vis -vis minimizes the amount of, um, you know, uh, white privilege uh, they can they can functionally claim in society. So, uh, you know, we have about three, and you can correct me if I'm not quite getting this right, but from my reading of your article, we have about three um, designations or classifications that get confused sometimes. So we have Arab American, we have mm -hmm. Middle Eastern or Middle Eastern American, right, and we have Muslim American. Mm -hmm. And even though these three classifications don't really mean the same thing, so for example, I think it would be news to a lot of Americans, um, both before and after 9-11, that not all Arabs are Muslim, uh, some are Christian. Yeah. Um, there's still a conflation of these three categories. and. I'd just love to hear your thoughts, first of all, on how these categories came to be conflated in the first place, and mm -hmm. then how we should go about disentangling them now that they are conflated. There's, there definitely should be disentanglement, because the different, the different tags or different labels you know, encompass uh, different demographics. So you're exactly right when you talk about Arab Americans, uh, and the majority are Christian. Uh, the majority of Arab Americans still today are Christian. Um, at somewhere at 60 to 65 percent. So when I speak to different audiences and, and um, you know, Detroit, which is a hub for Arab Americans, um, when I share that statistic, they're surprised as well. So you have that same level of, um, you know, mystification within the community. And we talk about Muslim Americans. Uh, Muslim America is extremely diverse. The biggest plurality of Muslim Americans are African American, followed by South Asian and then Arab American, and then Middle Eastern American, which I find the most troubling. Um, you know, the Middle East itself is a, it's kind of a fictitious post-colonial or even pre-colonial uh, geographic designation uh, in the American experience today has been converted into a standalone ethnic classification uh, which encompasses, uh, you know, a wide range of distinct cultures in, <laughs> the, you know, the Eastern Hemisphere. E each tag kind of contains radically different demographics in between, so making the conflations and making the... Uh, you know, making them synonyms, I think just adds to um, a greater misunderstanding of who these peoples implicated by the labels are. And I think that it goes back to what you said earlier about the day-to-day -day experiences. So saying that these three categories are synonymous when they're really not, well, that obscures uh, different experiences that the different people who, who ostensibly fall under each label have. 
Um, so do you, so just to pick up on something that you said about the Middle Eastern label and how it's kind of a post-colonial product, do you think it would be better if that label was retired just because it doesn't really refer to anything organic, or do you think that there's, you know, something to be said for it, um, given that it's, that it has, that it does have some content now? Yeah, it's it's a tough question, and I'm I'm still you know I'm I'm somebody who's still grappling with whether it has any utility. I, I think that it has some political utility, for instance, because uh, you know the the tag Middle Eastern, for instance, encompasses a wide range of different groups of people, um, you know, American diaspora groups who you know share similar political experiences, especially post 9/11. So if you talk about Iranians. Uh, you know, clearly the racial uh, racial profiling of Iranians or Kurds or Chaldeans or, you know, a range of different um, ethnic groups who come from the quote-unquote Middle East. There's a lot of shared political experience that I think can be um, leveraged positively to have, you know, a positive political influence on, you know, voting, um, you, know, uh, having, you know, having a specific impact with presidential candidates or even like local um, and state-based candidates and so forth. So it can be deployed in a positive way. My only fear is that you know, giving that term credence, I think, um, continues to only perplex individuals' genuine understanding of the diverse range of peoples who come from the region that is now known as the Middle East. So it's kind of a paradox in a lot of ways. Yeah, and there are some interesting similarities there with the term Asian American, which yeah. was really not a thing until the murder of Vincent Chin in the early 1980s, which um, I'm going to be having a guest in a future segment talk about that and how that really um, galvanized Asian American identity and brought together a group of people who really didn't see themselves as falling into the same category before. Uh, Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, Korean Americans, Southeast Asians, South Asians, um, all of these groups came to identify with one another, at least to a limited degree, under, under the umbrella term Asian American. And I think that that's had a lot of political utility in terms of alliance building and building um, community among these different groups. On the other hand, I think that especially for outsiders, it's a term that has led to a lot of a lot of misunderstanding and stereotyping and so I can definitely understand what you're saying about it being a double bind. So yeah. there's yeah, I mean there's some interesting parallels there certainly between, you know, this term Middle Eastern, the term Asian American, of course there's important differences as well. That actually leads into one of the other questions that I was really interested in getting your take on, which is the use of categorization more generally, both legally and socially. So people might not know this, but the categories that we see on the census, those are not carved in stone. So mm -hmm. every time the census has been administered, beginning in the 1800s, the racial and ethnic categories that were present on the census were different. There were literally not two administrations of the census in a row when the categories remained the same. So racial identity and ethnic identity is constantly being constructed in ways that I think are really interesting and provocative and, you know, say things about uh, who we are as a culture and how we view particular groups. So I'd love uh, to get your perspective, speaking generally, um, as well as speaking more specifically about Arab Americans. Um, why does it matter how we classify people? Like, why does it change, you know, from one administration of the census to the next? And why does it matter that it changes from one administration of the census to the next? I think first of all, it's, uh, the first question is existential. I think that every community, especially uh, you know maligned or marginalized communities, you know have a, you, a strong internal desire to want to be acknowledged, not only acknowledged but be um, you know acknowledged accurately by you know the government. So first, I think it's a broader kind of um, you know personal existential kind of question. And then second, there's obviously political and ec economic ramifications, um, you know policing ramifications. Um, and concerns that people have of classification. You know, clearly being acknowledged as, accurately acknowledged as a standalone people gives you, you know, access to a range of um, government programs, initiatives that are race or ethnicity based and so forth. One concern that Arab Americans have, especially Arab Muslim Americans have, with um, there being a standalone Arab American or Middle Eastern classification is that they feel as if it'll make it easier for the government to profile and sur survey, surveil them. And that's one thing that's, you know, commonly debated within town halls 
um, community meetings and so forth. But my my guess is that they're already doing that, and that <laughs> um, you know uh, the NSA and so forth already have the stats based on you know community concentration and demographical figures they have internally. So my fear is that you know having a standalone classification won't intensify surveillance. So I think that the positives outweigh the negatives in many ways. My understanding is that you're advising and consulting with the OMB about how Arab Americans and Arab Muslim Americans should be classified on the next administration of the census. Is that right? It is. So the okay. parallel you brought up with, with Asian Americans I think is an interesting one. And it, it, there's parallels also being brought with Latino and Latino identity as well. One, one major distinction, Nancy, is um, religion and the fact that Islam is, you know, is so demonized in America today has been a real wedge issue for Arab Americans. So, for instance, a lot of Arab American Christians, right, one way they demonstrate their, um, their claim to whiteness is through their Christianity still today. So, you know, what I talk about in the article um, in terms of how religion functions as, you know, a proxy or a gateway to different racial groups, that's still playing out today. Um, and it's also an attempt to distance themselves from Muslim identity. And um, the Arab American Muslims, on the other hand, their Muslim identity has been, um, you know, an added racializer, which is, in, in many respects, amplified their uh, minority consciousness, right? And th their stronger collective desire to, to veer from, um, you know, formal whiteness. So I think the religious distinction is an important one, and I see this playing out with discussions I have with you know community members, stakeholders, and also with individuals at the census. Um, so it's interesting, you know, the same obstacle that you know undermined Arab Muslims from claiming whiteness during the naturalization era. Um, those themes are still very um, prominent today. So do you think that these themes subsided and then? intensified after 9-11? Or do you think this is something that's always been present and then perhaps 9-11 maybe just made more people aware of it? It, it didn't subside. It, it wasn't subsiding before 9-11 um, because I can tell you being from Detroit, which is the most concentrated, Arab, you know, both Arab and Muslim American community, that there was a range of incidents in the 90s and in you know, the 80s obviously too where um, um, Arab Muslims specifically always felt racially distinct and never really ceded to the classification of whiteness where um, Arab American Christians generally speaking have been in the country for a lot longer right so in terms of um, you know time, time just being in the country longer they've had a greater opportunity to assimilate and so forth and the way the way religion functions is you hear Arab American Christians oftentimes saying I'm Christian and volunteering that information as a way to distinguish themselves from, um, you know, perceived racial or religious threat. Um, so it wasn't subsiding pre-9/11. It was, it was there, but it became far more uh, pronounced after 9/11. In your discussions with OMB about how the census should reflect Arab American identity and should categorize people who identify in some way as Arab American, how do you think that? This complicated intersection between um, ethnicity and religion. How do you think that should be translated into a census form? Do you do, do you think like is there one answer that you're advocating for at this point? There is kind of like the, this two-part structure that I that I'm advocating for, um, which essentially allows an individual to identify as. Um, Middle Eastern, and then there's a secondary question that's linked to that primary question that allows an individual to identify their nationality or your ethnic classification. Um, so you can check off Middle Eastern, and then if you're Arab, you can say Arab American. If you're um, Persian or Iranian, you can say Iranian American. If you're Turkish, you can say Turkish American. Um, so it's, it's a two-part structure. I think the same way the uh, Latino question is, is set up. Um, so that's, that's the approach that I'm advocating for. I um, mean, also, so in addition to st structural reform, I'm also suggesting specific uh, language-based reforms. Now, how successful I'll be in, <laughs> in terms of advocating for what I think is, is ideal um, is another question. 
But the question of religion is one that obviously is challenging because you can't... It's difficult to impute religion formally into racial classifications, even though it's imputed on the ground all the time, especially with Islam, right? So that's, that's a dissonance, I think, between um, the law and these legal classifications with how individuals, not only individuals, but government agencies, you know, racially, uh, racialize individuals when making decisions to profile or decisions to hire or recruit individuals on a daily basis. So there's that disconnect, which is really challenging. And I think that you raise an important distinction here, which is that, yes, there's the official position and there's uh, the way that people are classified individually, but even the official position, you know, when you talk about what agencies are doing, well, it's really just what the individual officials who are the face of the agency are doing. So maybe, you know, the police department has a certain policy with respect to ethnic identity, but then it's just individual police officers on the street who are administering that policy, and they may do so imperfectly, even if it's the best policy in the world. And so, you know, I mean, I think this point you're making that uh, there is this interaction between the legal and the social, it's a really important point. Um, do you think that what OMB does with respect to the census. Do you think that whatever decision they make there about categorization, whether they adopt your two-part structure, um, but it, whether they adopt that or whether they adopt something else, do you think that there will be felt consequences on the ground for people who are currently somewhere under the Middle Eastern umbrella? So one thing that I think should be addressed is the fact that there's a considerable segment of Arab Americans who want to maintain formal whiteness. Can, can you opposition. tell me a little bit more about that? I actually, um, yeah. I, I don't know that much about it. So, like, who, like, what is the constituency that's interested in maintaining formal whiteness? And if I, if I could generalize, the constituency is generally um, individuals from the Levant, and the Levant um, would include, um, you know, modern-day Lebanon, Syria. Um, Palestine and Jordan. So that's one um, that's one trait. The second trait would be these are individuals who are multi-generational. So individual uh, individuals and families who have been here for for generations and came with the initial waves of, of uh, immigration from the Arab world. So we're talking about late 19th century, early to mid 20th century. So they've been in the states for a long time. Um, they've achieved a certain level of economic uh, success and upward mobility. Um, they've assimilated into, you know, quote unquote, mainstream American culture. Um, many of them have, you know, essentially turned their Arab identity invisible. So, you know, one prominent example would be um, Republican Congressman uh, Darrell Issa. He's of Lebanese origin, and he, he's kind of like an archetype in, in some respects of the segment of um, Arab American society who is still latching on strongly to formal whiteness. And the majority of them would be Christian. You know, again, I'm generalizing, so I don't, mean, I don't want to stereotype, but... Yeah, uh, no, I mean, we're a, you're always... Whenever you're talking about the census or something like that, of course, you're talking about generalizations, right? And not, not, not specific individuals, necessarily. Yeah, so then you have the second um, half, I, I would say, which is generally um, Muslim, uh, new immigrants, working class, um, from a, a wide range of uh, countries in the region, um, North Africa, some Sub-Saharan African, um, who phenotypically can't pass in the same way that a, a Levantine Arab can. So you, phenotypic questions, um, you know, passing issues linked to religion, which not only complicates their um, claim to formal whiteness, but in some respects, racially speaking, makes them visibly anything but white. Right? Uh, and then you have issues that are linked to um, so some Sudanese Americans and Sub-Saharan um, African Arabs identify as both Arab and black, right? So you have a range of, I think, different um, modalities for how individuals identify, which makes whatever resolution OMB makes an incomplete one. But I think that, so the way I've approached this entire process is that um, journeying toward an identity, I think it's going to take time, and I think improving on the current situation um, would be a positive step forward. I was reading a poll that highlighted the contrast between a poll that was taken in November, four, November 2014, which found that only 1% of Americans felt that race relations was the number one most important issue facing the United States today, compared with a poll that was taken in late December 
2014, which found that 13% of Americans thought that race relations was the most important issue, the number one most important issue facing the United States today. And obviously that's a big change, and I think that we can attribute a lot of it, if not all of it, to the events in Ferguson and Staten Island and activism, such as the activism on Twitter, the Black Lives Matter hashtag. So I'm interested in your thoughts on how Arab Americans, um, Arab Muslim Americans, how these groups fit into the racial profiling conversation that's taking place as the result of the deaths of Michael Brown and Eric Garner and Tamir Rice and John Crawford and mm -hmm. way too many other people. Um, how, how, does, how, does Arab, how does Arab American identity fit into this conversation about race that we're having right now in the United States that's really come to the forefront just in the past few months? In a number of ways. I think that you know Arab Americans, um, especially post 9-11, have been clearly victims of racial profiling. Um, and that's engendered, I think, a stronger um, source of um, empathy with, um, you know, other experiences of racial profiling um, with African Americans, um, Latino Americans, and other demographics who are linked to suspicion. So in many respects, I think that that experience of um, victimization has built, not strong, but at least preliminary bridges to understanding um, the experiences of profiling um, of other communities. Second, and one thing that I've really worked on, um, I've been working on really closely, is addressing anti-black racism within Arab and Muslim American circles, which is very strong. Why, why is that? For people who aren't necessarily familiar with uh, the, the history and the cultural dynamics, to the extent that it's present, why is anti-black racism prevalent or I don't want to use the word prevalent, but why, yeah. why, is it, why is it something that we sometimes see in Arab American communities? You, you have two parallel kind of dynamics which really come, which, which really cross when, when, Arab, when Arabs come to the States. First you have, um, you know, obviously the, the colonial experience uh, with much of the Arab world being colonized by Europe and France and, you know, them bringing a specific um, epistemology with them which you know, lauds and reveres whiteness, and obviously the antithesis of whiteness is, is blackness. Um, so you have individual, you have, you have very strong and entrenched anti-black um, racism in the region that is, uh, a resi you know, a, a, is residual, but also a continuation of, of that legacy. Um, but then you have, you know, Arabs who come stateside and are conditioned by, by American racism, and, you know, a distinct form of anti-black racism that is... Um, that is perpetuated here in the States. And those two things come together um, within Arab American households in the States today, um, which in some respects intensifies the anti-black racism of Arab Americans versus you know, other groups, because they have these two kind of sources of racism that come together. And so I cut you off. You were talking about how um, maybe the events of Ferguson and Staten Island and other communities, tragic as they are, have potentially yeah. offered an opportunity for some shift in that? I think that's the direction that you were going in. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm hoping for a shift. One thing that's also important to note, I think I, I mentioned this earlier, is that the biggest plurality of Muslim Americans are black, right? So we're talking about 30% of Muslim America is black. Um, and the fact that you have that strong demographic, I think, creates for spiritual affinity um, amongst black and Arab American um, and also South Asian Muslims that can ideally unravel into um, you know, cross-racial understanding, um, building solidarity along lines of you know, similar issues, um, and using um, you know, spiritual bases and institutions like mosques, for instance, to, do, to be springboards for anti-racist work. It's been hard, right, because you have the same kind of mistrust towards Arab and South Asian Muslims from black um, perspectives which is completely justified given the history. What's happening in Ferguson, what's happening in New York, what's ha and what's happening nationally with these protests, I think is creating an opportunity for real honest discourse, um, which, which are really unprecedented in many ways, which I think um, is creating opportunity for um, eroding the kind of racism that's so, um, that's so pronounced in Arab American um, households. What do you think is the catalyst that's needed to translate into that you know, material on the ground support? 
you, you know, it, it's a tough question. I think that um, I, I think the real catalyst, to be frank with you, and I'm just being completely honest, is um, really diminishing racism within Arab American households, right? Because you have you have parents, you have you know older guard, older generation um, figures passing on and you know perpetuating very racist perspectives towards black people. You know, it's manifested in a range of ways, like who you can date, who you can hang out with. Um, the kind of music you listen to, the kind of neighborhoods you should and shouldn't hang out in. And that's um, certainly not, <laughs> just speaking from yeah. my own experience growing up in Littleton, Colorado, I mean, that's certainly not limited to Arab American households or, um, you know, Detroit or anything like that. I think that's, you know, yeah. sort of a, a pretty pervasive American experience. Yeah, it, it's, very persuas it's, it's very pervasive across, you know, different ethnic um, and, more, and minority lines. What, what makes it really, I think, almost violence in a place like Detroit is you you have new immigrant community you have a new uh, immigrant Arab community which do business in primarily black neighborhoods and then you have Arab community that live side by side with black communities and so forth interaction is really low and that the only times uh, is oftentimes the only the only spaces for communication um, become very tense and become very violent so there's a history of really hostile um, relationships between Arab and African Americans in this city, which makes it a real challenge. So, as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, Khaled has very kindly agreed to come back and discuss the significance of his research, particularly in light of some of the recent events just in the past week or so. Uh, Khaled, thank you so much for rejoining us here on the RightsCast. Thanks again for having me. Let's start just by filling in any viewers who might not necessarily be completely up to date with everything that's been happening recently. So I think most people are familiar with the Chapel Hill shootings, but what else has been going on in addition to that? And um, what is the effect that this is having within the Arab American and Muslim communities? Well, since we last spoke, there's been a, a string of, of, of events, a string of possible hate crimes, leading with what happened in Chapel Hill with the three young Muslim American students executed on campus by Craig Hicks. Um, in addition to that, there was also, there was also an attack on uh, an Islamic school in Rhode Island. There was also a targeted arson on a mosque in Houston in Texas. Um, there was also a shooting of a Somali-Canadian Somali um, man in Alberta, Canada, um, and also an attack on a father in Dearborn, Michigan, in the metropolitan Detroit area where I come from. So you had this string of um, incidents targeting Muslims and targeting Arabs in less than a week's time. This is not being reported by the mainstream media as a string of attacks on uh, Muslim Americans. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that these are being reported as isolated events or really not reported very much at all as opposed to part of a larger pattern? I think it's part and parcel of the logic, um, even more than the logic, I would say the culture of viewing, of dism dismissing Islamophobia, right? Especially in terms of the way it's covered in the media, you know, suppressed in the media, and also how the law treats the targeting of Muslims, but not only Muslims, but individuals perceived as Muslims. Um, so to acknowledge it as a string of attacks, as, as this network of, um, you know, tied attacks on individuals um, who, you know, ascribe to a certain faith, I think an acknowledgement or an admission on the part of the media and state actors that, hey, there's something wrong going on in the country, and if to make that acknowledgement, uh, you'd have to do something about it. <laughs> and I don't think the media... Um, or state actors are ready to acknowledge that this country is experiencing, you know, Islam, kind of an Islam, Islamophobic flashpoint that requires state actors um, in their pro, you know, in their proxies to take action. During our last conversation, we spent a lot of time talking about the way that the legal system plays a role in constructing Arab American identity, and we talked about the conflation of Arab American identity, Muslim identity and Middle Eastern identity, uh, we talked about the problems uh, in particular with the latter term, but we talked about how those three terms are often blended together and treated as though they're synonyms when in fact they refer to different groups of people and different lived experiences. 
what does your work have to say in relation to uh, this string of potential hate crimes against Muslim Americans? Well, I think a range of things. I think one thing that's really, um, you know, crystallized is the fact that we view the law as a monolith, right? We view the law as kind of this consolidated um, block or, you know, singular actor which views um, specific communities, specific demographics in a certain way. And I think that uh, these, this string of incidents has shown two things, that even though there's a uniform kind of consistent perspective for who Muslims are, you know, caricaturing and conflating all these different demographics that you discuss, um, there's also a fractured interpretation and perception of what Arab American identity is. You know, you have the two primary actors, which we discussed last time, the census um, and the Office of Business and Management, which views Arab Americans as, you know, white by law, Caucasian again. However, you have the NSA, you have different actors which surveil and spy on individuals or Arab American who don't view them as white by virtue of them caring for, you know, for these surveillance tactics. So even though you have this kind of consistent, conflated perception of who Muslim Americans are, you have this kind of disconnected and fractured idea from a, from a per se perspective as to what the state thinks or believes Arab Americans are, which demonstrates, I think, that the two communities aren't connected at all, and they're distinct, but um, that, that degree of distinction uh, or acknowledgement that they are separate communities that sometimes overlap um, has not at all affected or eroded the idea that Arabs and Muslims and Middle Easterners are one and the same, and that stereotype is still, you know, heavily entrenched, and I think a lot of that's attributed to the fact that you have these tropes that have been so, that have been um, you know, cultivated for centuries, that they're going to be really tough, really challenging to dislodge and dismantle. I've really appreciated some of your recent writing on this topic, um, both, of course, this article that we've been discussing and your writing in the popular media in the wake of this wave of violence. And something that I'd really be interested to hear your thoughts on is why people are so resistant to seeing the disconnect in the way that white people are portrayed when they commit crimes mm -hmm. and Muslims or Arab Americans are portrayed when they commit crimes. I think that, you know, if a if an Arab American, for example, had gone into an apartment and gunned down three young white students mm -hmm. at the University of North Carolina, I am certain that the word terrorist would be in every headline. You know, I'm on Twitter. We're both on Twitter. I can't even imagine what your uh, notifications look like right now. I tweeted maybe twice about, you know, this issue of why nobody's using the word terrorist to describe the attack uh, in Chapel Hill. And suddenly my mentions were full of angry white men telling me that, uh, you know, this wasn't terrorism, this was just a crazy guy who was mad about a parking space. Um, why do you think, so first of all, why do you think people are so resistant to seeing that there is a very real difference in the way that these two groups are portrayed, depending on who's the perpetrator and who's the victim? Why do you think there's this resistance? And then secondly, what can we do about the fact that people are so reluctant to see these parallels or at least acknowledge the possibility uh, that there is this disparity in the way that different groups are portrayed in the media. You know, when I think about that, I think I'm, I'm coming to grips with the idea, not the idea, but the realization that um, people interpret terrorism along racial and religious um, lines. You know, terrorism is more, you know, a noun than it is a verb. People are more concerned with the identity of the actor versus the specific action of the actor. So if we look at Craig Hicks, um, you know, the killer uh, of the three young students in North Carolina, right? He, his actions, um, at least from, a, you know, a prima facie perspective, demonstrate that he was acting in line with what a terrorist act would look like, right? He was driven um, to commit really violent acts by a specific ideology, right? These are essentially the two kind of cornerstone elements of what a terrorist act are. You know, he, he killed three people, um, and his um, decision to kill those three people was, in part, it seems, again, it's really premature, so I don't want to speculate, but it seems, based on the facts we have on the table th thus far, that maybe his um, rigid interpretation and kind of strident atheistic views might have fueled that, right? So if we were to kind of supplant atheism in that instance with, with Islam, 
right? And like you said, um, work with the hypothetical that Hicks was an Arab or a Muslim. This would undeniably, undeniably be characterized and headlined as a terrorist act. Again, because there's less concern for the actual activity and the act itself in meeting what the legal definition of terrorism is, and it's more so the actual identity of the culprit. Um, and your hypothetical, I think, makes perfect sense. I state it um, the way you did in the article, that if you, you know, make a role reversal and view the three victims as, you know, as young white students and the culprit as um, an Arab or Muslim, not only would this receive headlines of terrorism, but the headlines would be prolific. It would be, you know, a global issue. You know, global alarm would be, uh, would probably uh, meet or maybe possibly exceed what we saw a month earlier with Charlie Hebdo, because we're dealing with young students, right? Young students are always viewed as being more vulnerable, and they occupy a specific special place in people's hearts and minds, especially in the media space. So I completely agree that if uh, there was a, ra you know, a racial or a religious reversal with the uh, actors involved, this would be a radically, uh, radically different story. Another thing that I found really puzzling is this idea that if it was a parking dispute, then it can't have been a terrorist act, or it can't have been a hate crime. Yeah. And I think what that overlooks is that, well, it could probably be both. I mean, probably um, Mr. Hicks was engaged in more than one parking dispute in his life, mm -hmm. but the one in which he ended up killing three people was the one in which the three people were all young Muslims. And so it's a little bit puzzling to me why people think that it has to be an either-or situation rather than thinking about, well, what was it about these three specific people that might have caused him to erupt in violence when surely this was not the only parking dispute he had in his life? No, I, mean, I completely agree with you. I find that baffling. I find it illogical that people can kind of displace the possibility that you had this broader context of um, you know, anti-Muslim bigotry and animus just by virtue of there being one parking dispute. I mean, you can't contextualize this dispute within a broader, um, you know, circumstance of, of tension, of animus. Um, the facts that have come out have demonstrated that, that these individuals have had um, Hicks and the three uh, young victims had run-ins before in the past. They were neighbors in the same unit, so there was some interaction um, between the parties before the parking dispute. I think that one thing that has been somewhat suppressed, to be frank with you, on the media coverage is uh, the gender component, right? I think that, um, you know, if Hicks, in fact, had strong Islamophobic leanings, then his specific targets would be the woman who wore the hijab, right? The other individual, Dia Barakat, um, the, the, the young man who was killed, um, will be frank. He can, you know, phenotypically pass as white. You know, so he's not going to be detected as somebody who's um, Muslim unless you knew the individual or unless he wore a beard on one occasion or he wore, you know, Islamic garb while going to the mosque on Friday. But you saw in Razan, the two young girls who were killed, his, his wife and his sister-in-law, they, you know, they don the hijab um, whenever they're out in public. So obviously they're conspicuously detectable as Muslim perpetually. Um, and my guess is that Hicks probably made the detection that they were Muslims based on um, the two women, and this is especially concerning to me, obviously, right, because most men, like myself, I mean, men, Muslim men, generally speaking, can pass for a range of different ethnicities or religion oftentimes, but that isn't a, a circumstance that's afforded to women, right? So what's, what's really fearful um, emanating from North Carolina is that there's a rising culture of um, extreme fear on the part of women, on the part of women who don the headscarf to be out in public spaces to possibly expose themselves to this kind of violence that we saw in North Carolina. So I think the gender dynamics, that intersection between religion and gender identity is something that hasn't adequately been addressed in the media um, with regard to Chapel Hill. Yeah, I really appreciate that comment and I think it's always important in these situations not to lose sight of intersectionality and the way that uh, religion and race or racialization and gender all come together and create different kinds of biases and potentially um, you know trigger different sorts of animus. Something that I really appreciated in our previous conversation um, a few weeks back was getting to discuss with you um, some of the tensions or issues that are ongoing right now 
within the Arab American community or within the Muslim community. And, uh, you know, we talked about um, some of the tension between, um, for example, um, Arab Americans who are Muslim and Arab Americans who are Christian. I don't know if maybe tension is too strong of a word, but certainly um, a less than perfect alignment of interests. Mm -hmm. And so I'm interested, you know, you've described this really horrific um, series of acts of violence. And I'm interested in particular in some of the ideas that you raised in one of your recent pieces in Al Jazeera. There's a link to it below the video for anybody who's interested in reading about it. But so in this uh, article, you talked about how um, the media coverage of these recent acts of violence has varied depending on some of the demographic characteristics of the victims that vary even within um, sort of the broader category of Arab American or uh, the broader category of Muslim. And I'd love it if you could just elaborate on uh, what those demographic differences are mm -hmm. and how you see them affecting both the media coverage and the way that these events are viewed within Arab American and Muslim communities. Yeah, you know, the, the string of events, I think, uh, you know, um, Chapel Hill, uh, what happened in Houston, you know, with the mosque fire, um, what's happened recently in Rhode Island with the, with the Islamic school being vandalized, uh, the killing of the young Somali Muslim Canadian in Alberta, um, and unfortunately the string of events that are you know, likely, have, likely to happen in the imminent future, I think have really crystallized a couple of things. The first thing that they've really highlighted is um, two things that the media generally is not going to race to cover issues involving um, Muslim victims, right? We saw that with Chapel Hill on Tuesday, um, that there was actually a lull. There was an eight-hour period um, after the police discovered that these young three students were killed before any national media addressed it. And my strong guess is that you had this social media storm, especially on Twitter, which essentially pushed the media, um, you know, to really cover what was going on in Chapel Hill. So eight hours, right, eight hours to cover a story involving three young students, to me is alarming. And then in addition to that, the day before you had this young Somali man who was killed in Canada, which got no, no coverage, national coverage in Canada, and little to no attention in the States. Now people will say, hey, you know, this happened in Canada, why is it, you know, the American media's uh, concern to address a specifically foreign or Canadian issue? Right. That's that's one that's one possible response. I was less concerned with and two again the second point I'd like to make less concerned with the media's coverage in this point. I was more concerned in the article with how the broader Muslim community responded to these two different issues. So you have media response and then you have community response. You know, two distinct things. So with the media response, not at all surprising that they didn't cover the Chapel Hill shooting, and that was definitely echoed. Or I'm sorry, um, you know, emulated with what happened with Matan up in Canada. However, the, the community response was really, uh, was really concerning because people really rushed and, you know, voiced considerable alarm with regard to the three uh, young students in, in, uh, in Chapel Hill. That wasn't the case for Matan. Now, um, that really, to me, demonstrated that um, there was some racial, racial overtones. The fact that you had three, um, you know, fair-skinned, um, Arab victims in Chapel Hill, and you have to understand within the Muslim American community there is a racial hierarchy and stratification where you know Arab Americans do attain a specific amount of privilege. It's complex. It's not only linked to phenotype and how you look. It's linked to the idea that Islam was you know conceived or revealed in the Arab world, right? So the hierarchy works uh, twofold. Um, so there was a rush of concern, a rush of support, a rush of solidarity to the victims in Chapel Hill. And real, you know, crickets with regard to the response to um, Mustafa Matan in Canada, who yeah. is um, East African and black. Um, I'm not saying it's entirely attributed to um, intra-Muslim racism or anti-blackness, but I think that it can be overlooked as a salient factor. And this is something that we talked about quite a bit the, the, in our last conversation, just the idea that there is... Um, as in many communities, strains of anti-black racism. And, uh, you know, so I really appreciate the fact that you're willing to point that out and to kind of tackle that, that, that tough issue. I suppose just in conclusion, you know, I mean, this string of events that you've described, I mean, it's 
really grim and frankly just really heartbreaking. So I guess I would just be interested in hearing your thoughts about what might be done moving forward both within the community and outside the community. Like are there productive things that we can take away from this? Are there productive things that we can do? Are there lessons that we can learn? Well, you know, it, it's hard to kind of look at the glimmers of hope, um, you know, amid, um, you know, I guess considerable tragedy and ongoing tragedy, but there are, there have been some positive developments um, taking place and even before these incidents uh, came about. You know, I think one positive development is that um, I think for the first time in a very robust way, there's real efforts on the part within the Muslim American community across racial groups to really build cross-racial um, uh, and cross-community literacy and understanding, right? There's an acknowledgement that racism exists, and there's been real progressive and, and honest efforts to resolve that. Um, and I think that these, um, these tragedies have essentially, have essentially showed that the community that, hey, you got to galvanize that these, these, this anti-Muslim bigotry affects individuals regardless of who their ra what, what their race is, in disparate ways, obviously, because of intersectional identities. But, you know, hate is going gonna, is gonna to affect Muslims across racial and ethnic groups um, to some degree. And that urgency, I think, has led to some galvanization and real honest, real talk about the differences in racism within the community. That's been really positive. Um, as the macro development. As a micro development, I can tell you that with regard to Mustafa, Mustafa Matan, that um, the outcry and uh, you know some of the media work we were able to do fortunately helped the family raise money for the funeral. Um, this was a working class indigent family that had didn't have the resources to bury their son who was roughly 2,500 miles away from home. Understand, this guy left Ottawa to go to Alberta. That's like traveling from D.C. to go to you know Portland, Oregon. Yeah. Um, long way from home, um, transporting a, you know, a, the body of a, a young dead man costs money. So being able to raise funds for a family like that, I think, I um, mean, the community really coming together um, was really heartening. Um, you know, and third, I think that, you know, for better or for worse, you know, crisis or crises um, really spawns consciousness. It spawns political consciousness and activism, especially amongst apathetic elements of the community. Now, Muslim America is really broad and diverse, like I've discussed. Um, but I can tell you that these incidents have really awakened uh, um, factions of the community that have been idle for a long time. You know, and this urgency, I mean, not that things were urgent before, because they were, right, with, with things we couldn't see and things that weren't on the media every day, uh, with NSA surveillance, counter-extremism measures, profiling, all of that. The urgency's been there. But now it's a lot more naked, it's a lot more vivid, that it's really mobilizing people to take action now. And people who before um, were either idle or were either apathetic, that isn't the case anymore. Well, Khaled, thank you so much again for joining us to talk about not only your article, but then circling back to talk about the implications of your work and your research for um, this recent string of events. I learned a lot, and I'm sure the other viewers have as well. No, thanks again for having me. I really appreciate it. This has been an episode of The Rightcast. I'm Nancy Leong, and I look forward to seeing you next time.